rights uh, be animated in game development, or maybe you're in the movie industry and you've kind of worked with animation there. There's a lot to cover, but for today, I think it's important to just focus on what is animation or how is animation relevant for Android. Uh, as I've talked a lot in my previous lectures, um, in Android development, we really must focus on user experience uh, and user friendliness. And this is exactly where animations come into play in Android development. This is because animations can add visual cues that notify users about what's going on in your app. They're especially useful for when the UI states change and also uh, for example, when new content loads or new actions become available. And they can also add this polished look to your app and that makes it more, uh, feel more like higher quality and have a better feel to it. Um, and now I realize that I'm not recording, so I'll start recording. Um, uh, so I, I already started. So you already started? Going. Okay, yeah. cool. We have more. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. Um, yeah. So uh, personally, I think animations are really important, um, but they're often just thought of as sprinkles that you can add to your app at the end of the development process. And this is often also leading to that people just don't put them in uh, because what ends up happening is that once you get to the end of your development process, you run out of time or you have so many features that you just wanna crunch in that you end up discarding the ones that you consider to be less important. Um, but animations really contribute to the usability of your application. So that's why you should kind of put them in as you go uh, and also like um, be more agile and try to just put it in without and not leave them to the end. And that really goes for a lot of UI elements. Personally, I start, when I start making an app, I start by making the UI and then I add the, uh, the content to it, but like we're all different, but just try to make it put in there somewhere. Yeah, so um, animations really contribute to the usability of your application because they can help establish a sort of spatial model so that when you use the app, you can have a sense of place within the application. Uh, and also they can help hint, give hints to the user uh, as to how they can interact with your app. So Android includes different animation APIs depending on what type of animation that you want. So here you can see a list of different APIs that are links, I put some links in here, to the relevant documentation that is based on your needs. Uh, so, for example, we have uh, different APIs for animating drawables, uh, for changing or animating the UI visibility or motion. You, if you want to put some physics in there, we have physics-based motion uh, and uh, animating layout changes, animating between activities. So, pretty much, as you can see, there are so many things that you can animate in Android. Uh, and there are also some other APIs that you can use, but for today, I'll just cover these ones. So when you want to animate a bitmap or uh, such as an icon or illustration, you should use the Drawable Animations API. Usually these animations are defined statically, like that you have a drawable resource in your resource folder, but you can also define the animation behavior at runtime. We have an example here to the right uh, where you animate a button, a play button, and then when you click it, it transforms to a pause button. And this is very really nice because it communicates to the user that the two actions are related. Uh, and then, you know, like when you pause, then it actually starts, it pauses your video, for example, or if you play, then it indicates that it's gonna start playing again. So there's a lot of communication going on here between your app the technology and the user. Uh, so Android provides a couple of options for animating drawables. Uh, and one of them is called animation drawable. 
in this class. And this allows you to specify several static drawable files. So if you have some drawables in your research this folder, you can use them and then they will be displayed one at a time to create an animation, sort of like the bouncing ball that we saw at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, another option is to use something called uh, animated vector drawable, which lets you animate the properties of a vector drawable, but uh, vectors can be kind of hard to understand and they're very math-like. So uh, I'll just focus on the animation drawable for today. But of course, uh, if you're interested in learning more about animations, uh, then you should feel free to explore the second one by yourself. So then the question is, how do we use animation drawable? Uh, so one way is to load a series of drawable resources, one after another, to create the animation, uh, just like how you traditionally do it. Um, and because this is played in order, uh, it will show the nice animation. So the animation drawable is the class that is the basis for drawable animations. And you use uh, this class API uh, to define the frames of an animation through your code, where a frame is one picture or, you know, you've heard the term frames per second, so you kind of get that. Um, and the simplest and easiest way to do this is to create an XML file, sort of like this one, where you list the frames that make up the animation. Um, so the frame in this case is a drawable resource. Uh, and because uh, it's an XML file and you're gonna use it with drawables, you should put it in the resources slash drawable direct uh, directory inside your Android project. So this is one example of uh, how the XML file can look like. And uh, as you can see, we have this object here called animation list. And it has several items here, uh, or children called items. Uh, and each item uh, defines a frame. So this is one frame or one drawable. Uh, we can see that the drawable is a rocket thrust. So just by looking at the naming convention here, we see that the animation is about a rocket. Um, and we can also see that it contains three children, meaning there are three frames. And um, we have this attribute here called one shot, and, and it's set to true. And that means that it will cycle the animation just once, and then it will stop with the last frame. So when it stops, it will just display the last frame. However, if you put this one to false, then it's gonna loop the um, animation continuously. And that, if you do that, you also wanna make sure that the last frame kind of flows nicely with the first frame. Uh, and also, yeah, I can see here the duration is uh, 200. So you can change the dura uh, duration to have like different lengths and kind of make, make it work with whatever drawable you have. So let's have a look at how this would work in a sample activity. Um, so first, we're gonna create a variable for the animation drawable here. Uh, and then we're gonna go down here because this is just on create, and then this is where the juice happens. Um, so we're gonna find this image view by D, it's a rocket image. Uh, we're making a rocket animation. Uh, and then we're gonna find a, a background resource and set it. Um, this is gonna be the background, sorry, <laughs> the background resource is gonna be the XML file that we created here. So we're just gonna set this one as a background resource. Uh, and in order for this example to work, we're gonna make sure that the XML file must be saved as rocket thrust. Uh, and then in order to make this animation play, we're gonna have to write uh, rocket animation dot start and dot starts like starts the animation. Um, so what's important to note here is that this start method can only, um, cannot, sorry, cannot be called in on create. 
And that's why we put it inside this set on click listener. Um, this is because uh, the animation drawable has not been fully attached to the window inside your application yet. Um, and when we put it in this on click listener, uh, it will build and be attached and um, work on user input. Uh, so therefore, if you want to play the animation immediately without any user interaction, uh, then you should call it not inside on create, but the on start method in the activity. Uh, and because the on start function gets called when the Android makes the view visible on screen after everything has attached to it. Yes, so on to the next one. Um, this is for when you're gonna animate UI visibility and motion. Uh, so when you need to change the visibility or position of use in your layout, uh, you should try to include subtle animation. Oh, sorry, I got a question. So yeah, on start, uh, Jungana asks, so on start rather than on create, uh, it's true, so yes. If you want to make the application um, play without user in interaction, you should put it in on start. If you want it to be in a listener so that when a user presses a button, then you can put it in on create inside a listener. Uh, I'm not sure how this, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna read the question so in case people watching the recording does not get that. Um, does view or data binding influence where you want to put the code for the animation? Uh, I'm not really sure how uh, the view or data binding would affect that. Uh, Marius or Christopher, are you guys, do you guys know anything about this? So, so usually the, um, the view or data bindings are used for the content of the, um, of the fields. If you're using that for the presentation layer, then I'm not sure yeah, how would you combine it with animations. Um, yeah, I would need to check it out. Same here. I'm not sure what, uh, how the interaction would be. I mean, fundamentally, it really depends on how you want to uh, model and author uh, kind of the, the, the presentation, right? If you have assumptions about sequ sequential execution, um, as, as Elizabeth has outlined already, right? So it's the difference between the on create, on start, but uh, you would similarly uh, probably need to chain your data binding accordingly. For example, if you want to have an animation first and then display your data that you're linking to, but that would be intuition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, considering that all three of us are not sure about this, it's probably not relevant as Yuna said. So yeah, uh, yeah. if you guys have any questions, just ask, you know, I noticed them as soon as you read them. <laughs> Anyways, uh, back to UI visibility. Uh, yeah, so you, you're gonna want to uh, use subtle animations to help the user understand how and like why the, use, uh, the UI is changing. Um, so if you want to move or hide or reveal uh, views that you have within your current layout, um, you can use something called a property animation system, which is um, uh, provided through the android.animation package. And, and what, these, uh, what this package does is that um, it provides an API that updates the properties of your view objects over a period of time uh, and they continuously redraw the view whenever the properties change. So, for example, if you change the position uh, property, so uh, the, where the UI element is positioned, uh, then the view can move across the screen. Or if you change the alpha property, which is related to whether it, it's visible or not, so it's a value of one or zero, I think, um, you can change so that the view fades in or out. Um, and if you want to create these animations with the least amount of effort, uh, you can enable animations on your layout so that when you simply change the visibility of a view, the animation is gonna be applied automatically. 
Um, so when you use the property animation system, you can define the following characteristics uh, of the animation. So first, you can change the duration, meaning that uh, you specify how long the duration is going to last. I think the default length is about 300 uh, milliseconds, but I'm not really sure. I don't remember exactly numbers. You can also change time interpolation, uh, which is specifying the values for the property and how they're calculated uh, as a function uh, based on the animation's current elapsed time. Um, you can change the repeat count and behavior, meaning that you can specify whether or not to have the animation repeat itself when it reaches the end uh, and how many times you want to repeat the animation or if you want it to just continue playing, maybe you want it to be played back in reverse. Uh, so if you, it's worth noting that if you set it to reverse, when you play the animation forwards and then backwards repeatedly, then you're, it's just going to go on like that until the number of repeats is reached. Uh, you also can change the animator sets, um, which means that you can group your animations into logical sets that will play together sequentially or uh, after certain delays. Um, and you can also <laughs> set frame refresh delay, uh, which will specify how often uh, the frames of your animation will refresh. And the default here, I think it's 10 milliseconds. So now it's time to wonder, how does property animation actually work? So I'm just going to start by explaining this with a simple example. Uh, here you can see an example of a linear animation, which is animated based on the x value here, which is uh, representing the horizontal location on the screen. Uh, and then we have the duration, which is t, and for some reason the Google Drive always auto capitalizes my letters, so it's a big T here and a small one here, but this indicates the duration. So total here is 40 milliseconds. Uh, and you can see that the X, which is the location, uh, is changing by 40 pixels. And every 10 seconds, it moves 10 pixels. So uh, it's linear because uh, it changes the same amount each time, like it moves at a constant speed. Uh, and then at the end of the 40 milliseconds, the animation will stop and the object ends at the position X, which is 40. And um, yeah, and that's just a basic example of an anim animation with linear interpolation. Uh, and then let's take a look at Another example, which is a nonlinear animation, meaning that the object does not move at a constant speed like this one. And you can see here that the time elapsed is the same, like you have 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, so it's the same. But if you pay attention to the x value here, like here it increases with 10 each one, but here okay, 20 is the same, but it changes at a difference, like it's not linear. Uh, because what ends up happening here is that the object will accelerate at the beginning of the animation and then decelerate at the end. Uh, and those are like two different ways that you have like examples that you can animate. Um, so I thought another one type of animation that you could have uh, or in your project or that is nice to know about is physics-based motion. And I think maybe some of you will be exposed to physics in the graphics course and you know how imp important it is to make something um, more real, real world like. And that's why you should always uh, in your animations try to apply real world physics to make that animation look natural pretty much. For example, uh, your applications, those are your animations should maintain a sort of momentum. So when their target changes, as you can see here, uh, it will have a smooth transition. Um, you can tell that the left is not as smooth as this one, for example. Uh, and to 
encourage this behavior, you have an Android support library, which includes physics-based animation iPads. And this API relies on the laws of physics to control how this animation occurs. The thing is that animations that are not based on physics will end up looking very static and have a fixed duration. Uh, and then if the target value changes, like uh, as to the left here, then you need to cancel the animation at the time the value changes, reconfigure the animation with a new value, uh, and then the new value is the new start value, and then add the new target value. As you can see, it kind of cancels here and it looks kind of weird. Um, and as you can see, this creates this really weird abrupt stop in animation uh, and has a light disjointed uh, movement afterwards. So it doesn't look that nice. But on the other hand, if you have a look at this one to the right, this one has, uh, this one is an animation with the uh, physics-based animation API, which is, for example, called a dynamic animation API, as you can see here. Uh, and it's driven by force, so yeah, it's physics-based. And here, the change in the target value will therefore result in a change in force. And then the new force applies on the existing velocity, which makes it uh, a continuous transition to the new target and not like this abrupt one to the left. And what ends up happening is that this results in a very natural looking uh, animation looks very smooth. So I always try to aim for this one to the right if you notice like this weird uh, abrupt animation in your app. Uh, so another really relevant thing to consider animating is layout changes. Uh, on Android uh, above API level 19 or Android 4.4, you can use the transition framework to create animations where so for when you swap the layout with the current activity or fragment. So everything you need to do is that you have to specify which uh, layout is the starting layout and what layout is the ending layout. And then of course, what type of animation you want to use between them or when they're transitioning. Uh, and then the system figures out and executes this animation uh, and then you can just use this to swap out the entire UI or just replace some views. For example, as this one has a really nice and professional looking uh, animation going on. Uh, in this example, you can see that when the user taps an item to see more information, then it just changes the entire UI uh, and creates this transition from one layout to the other one. So um, earlier in the semester, I did mention material design. Uh, and at that point, I talked more about like how you can use it for designing your UI and creating like this persistent look across all your devices and all of that. But it's also nice to know that the material design guide also has some great tools for best practices regarding animations and motions within your application. Um, just <laughs> gonna put this out here that I'm gonna go back to material design quite a lot during this lecture because they have guides and everything and I found them to be good. So let's have a look here. So, Based on the material design guide, there are three principles uh, based animations. So the first one is that your animation should be informative. So I'll just read this out because who's going to read it if I don't? So the motion design informs users by highlighting relationships between elements, actions, availability, and action outcomes. It should be focused. So you should focus on what's important don't have unnecessary distractions, should be expressive, uh, which can, ex for example, express a brand style. Uh, you don't want animations that don't fit with your general brand. So let's have a look at some things that they say is good. 
hierarchy, for example. Uh, as you can see here, they use uh, the animations to see that the mail or message pops out from the inbox. So this creates this sort of hierarchy where you have a pattern element and a child element and looks very professional. You can see that it guides the user to what's coming. They can say, they can tell that they, uh, by clicking on the message, it turns them to like seeing the whole thing. So it's very like user friendly, this way of doing it. And, and also here, um, this motion of that when you press the button that you get this slowly feeling of that menu popping up is really nice. And here uh, you can see that there's also a relationship between the different tabs and just simply adding in an animation here makes it flow more and makes it more professional looking. And uh, for brand expression, I, I found this to be really nice because um, this is the, uh, for a recipe thing and you want it to be kind of flowy. It's not, it wouldn't fit if you had some other animation that would be too harsh. You want it to be smooth and very easy for the, for the user to just easily find what recipes or what information they need about the recipe. So uh, there are many like different things that you can look at here for animations with video examples. Uh, for example, like adding meeting. This one is really nice. If the lock changes, you can tell that it's gonna lock some, something. Um, so yeah, you guys can have a further look. I'll come back to material design after. So yes, let's continue. Uh, so basically what makes a good animation and uh, I'm gonna give some shout out to Christopher here. I stole this from your lecture slides last year. Go for it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's really important to remember that the animations should act as like a visual glue. Um, that means it should help the user to know where to look and what to pay attention to when they're using your application and guiding themselves through the content. Uh, but at the same time, it's important that the animation does not make up for the content itself because if you had an app where there are only animations in it, but no actual content, I mean, like who would end up using that app in the end? Uh, and then when you're choosing what animation will be the right for your app, you should try to not make the animation something that could be potentially annoying to the user. Like if you're constantly animating things just for animating them, and it takes up like too much space or the user gets disrupted, I mean, that would just be annoying as well. Um, and then when you use an animation for navigational purposes, you should consider what direction and level uh, of, if you consider like different layouts uh, of your application, you should know which one you want the user to focus on. And of course, um, you don't want to end up wasting the user's time because users uh, generally have some sort of expectation to how much time something will take. And if they have to wait a lot, they often get annoyed and can't be bothered to use your application. Uh, for example, if you download an app and you have tons of ads in it, and you have to watch a 30 second video for everything you're gonna do in the app, like you pretty much gonna delete that app and find a better one. It's the same with animations, like you don't want to use, uh, waste the user's time. Yes, um, so that was everything about animations for today. Just wondering if you guys have any questions to that part. Now is the time to ask before I start on widgets. Well, you guys see, seem good in the chat. So if questions pop up, I'm gonna answer them later. Well, anyways, Next topic is widget. Uh, widgets are an essential aspect of how you will customize your home screen and your phone. Um, and you can kind of imagine them as a preview or at a glance kind of view of the important data and functionality that an app can provide. 
And the clue with widgets is that it's going to be uh, accessible right from the user's home screen. And widgets are really nice because users can move them across their home screen panels and, you know, they can resize them or some phones allow for resizing at least. And then they kind of design their home, uh, their home screen around like what widgets they want to have to their preference. And it's important that if, if you plan on making a widget, um, just think about what kind of widget you're trying to build. And generally, we have like a different types of widgets here that we're going to go through today, just so you guys um, know what, which ones are there, which ones could you consider. Um, so the first one is information widgets, and then you have collection widgets, control widgets, and hybrid widgets. And the first one is uh, that we're going to go through is the information widgets. Uh, and the thing about information widgets is that they typically only display like a few crucial pieces of information. Uh, and then uh, these are typically also very important to the user, or maybe they track certain information that the user would want in their home screen and kind of try to follow along too. Uh, for example, this one is a weather application widget. You can see that it does not really show anything but what's most essential. Um, so if any of you have watched like uh, videos on YouTube about minimalism and like this Marie Kondo, like the whatever spark joy thing, uh, you know that it's all about finding the most important stuff and then getting rid of all the clutter. And that's pretty much what you're going to be thinking if you're making widgets like this, because you want to extract everything that makes adds the most value. So in this case of a weather application, the widget should just contain, okay, what weather is it? What's the temperature? You should probably mention where you're showing this and then you can display like small text, but like essentially you could simplify this to the sun and the degrees if you wanted to make it really simple. Uh, and then you can also, other types of widgets that fall into this category it could be clock widgets, sport score trackers, uh, and then pretty much like uh, what ends up happening is that if the user touches this app, uh, or sorry, this widget, it was going to launch the associated app and then open a more detailed view, meaning that if this is information that is not sufficient enough, they can tap it and then open the actual app to get more details. But this is a nice, just at a glance, I need to know what, what weather it is today without going into my apps, finding the app, and then going through all the tabs and everything. Like, this is just really nice. It gives you some information. Uh, another type of widget uh, is called the collection widget. Uh, and as the name says or implies, uh, a collection widget pretty much just displays a collection of things. So you have a collection of pictures or collection of articles, or you can have like collections of emails. Pretty straight to, uh, straight to the point. Um, but um, the use case for the collection widget is that you're going to browse the collection and then you can open a specified uh, item. So for example, here you can just scroll through and then find the message from Alex and Daniel. You open it and these are the most recent ones so you don't have to go into your messaging app or your inbox. Uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, these widgets can scroll vertically. So they're nice for organizing things. Um, you also have the control widgets, which is um, for displaying typically used functions that the user can just change and trigger from the home screen without going to their settings or opening an app first. So it's kind of like a remote control for the app without having to opening the app. Um, and typical examples for this are music uh, widgets where you can play, pause, or skip music or songs without actually going into the app. I guess if you want to make like an uh, audiobook uh, app as well, you could make a widget for controlling that. And then we have the hybrid widget. And 
this one, as, it, as you can tell by the name, is going to be a hybrid, uh, making it a mix of the previous types that I've talked about. Uh, and it seems like uh, most widgets tend to gravitate towards the ones, like to be either one of the three that I just mentioned. But you can also find like a lot of these hybrids that combine some of them. Um, so my advice to you guys, if you're gonna make a hybrid, uh, is to try to base your widget based on one of the other three types, and then you could you should add elements to it as you need. So uh, try to uh, try to pinpoint what are the most important elements and what are you trying to uh, assist the user with. And so an example here is a music player again. Um, as, as we talked about in the previous slide, the music uh, widget can help by controlling what, uh, what song is currently playing. Uh, so it's a control widget, but at the same time, it also displays information. So it's kind of also this information widget by displaying what song is currently playing. Um, so widgets are generally like mini apps, we could say. Um, and there are some few limitations considering that uh, the widgets live on the home screen. And there's a lot of different things going on on the home screen. So you have like these buttons down here, you have like more buttons here, navigational ones. Uh, and pretty much the fact that they're gonna have to compete with all the other things and just the whole architecture of the home screen, uh, it's gonna uh, limit what support is available for the widget and what sort of gestures that you can put into it compared to if it was a full, full-sized app that you were inside. Um, some apps, for example, they support a view pager and this one can allow users to navigate between screens uh, but this this motion of swiping between screens does not work in the home screen because it's already kind of taken off by this whole purpose of navigating between the home panels. So if you were to swipe between this one changing from this to another one, then you cannot use that gesture for the widget itself. And that means the only gestures that are left for widgets are touch and vertical swipe. Uh, and because there's this limitation on gestures, uh, I guess some of the UI building blocks that will rely on more, uh, more advanced gestures will not be available for widgets. Um, but then you guys realize that it's just a small thing. You're going to have to make the best out of it. And as I said, the summary, just try to compromise as much information the most essential information into the widget. Yep. Next topic, which I think you guys can uh, put into your assignment too, uh, is gonna be uh, haptic feedback, which is also known as haptics. Uh, so I'll go into this for about five minutes and then we can have a break at a regular time. Uh, so yeah, what is haptic feedback? Um, Haptics is like one way that you can use touch to communicate with your users. So I think a lot of you will be familiar with vibration you get in your phone. If you get a new text message or someone is calling or something is going on, you can find out this vibrational thing. But also sometimes when you're playing video games on your game controller, you're gonna get this sort of rumble -like feeling and that's pretty much like some examples of haptic feedback. But the thing is though, haptic feedback is so much more than that. Um, so generally, humans have five senses, um, but our technology and devices, they only communicate with us using two of them, primarily. The, these ones are sight, because we look at the screen, hearing by listening to notification sounds or video playing through the device, and it's all uh, through hearing. But this is where haptic feedback comes in because it simulates the sense of touch. 
not only can you touch your computer or device now, but this haptic feedback actually allows the computer or, or your phone or handheld controller to touch you back. Um, so that means it's a kind of mode of communication rather than just some sort of technology. And it's becoming this new way for uh, machines and humans to communicate that wasn't commonly used before. Uh, so for example, if you're using your Android phone and then you tap one of the buttons or you're writing on the keyboard and then it vibrates a bit, that's one example of haptics at work. So when we think about Android phones, they're pretty much just this square piece of plastic. You have this sheet of glass that's just smooth. There's not much going on. I mean, like all the buttons, they're not really physical buttons. It's just glass. Uh, so it's nice to have this haptic feedback to register and give some feedback to our fingers that something is going on. Because, okay, I don't know if you can hear this, but if I'm touching this key keyboard, you can hear this. That's one sort of feedback. And then if I'm touching or clicking on the mouse here, you can hear that. Like I can give feedback that I'm typing or I'm touching the mouse. And I get this audible, like, um, sort of uh, feedback from my hardware. Um, but on the smartphone, because it doesn't really have that hardware to provide that to us, um, I'm just gonna, when I'm pressing stuff, I'm pretty much just waiting for feedback and waiting for something to happen. And that's where it's really nice to put in haptics. Because this short and light vibration that you get when you type out your message with the, uh, with the keyboard can really make a huge difference to a lot of people because they get the Android or mobile technology uh, version of the hardware typing. Um, but actually what I found to be quite interesting is that when I was researching this slide, I actually found that based on 32,000 voters, 59% voted that they didn't use any haptics at all. Uh, and this is only for Android though. So that made me kind of curious. What do you guys think? Do you guys use it? Can you write in the chat if you guys use it or not? And then we can have a little discussion. What do you guys think about your phone vib vibrating when you're writing? You find it annoying? So we have Yongguna writing, he's planning to use, use tough chapsticks. Uh, and then seems like most people, okay, some people find it useful. Um, Yuna says it's a good idea to have it for blind people, et cetera. And I think that's, that's really true. Can give more feedback to the people who need this sort of assistance. But yeah, I see it's uh, three now, so let's have a break. Uh, let's say until 10 past, so you guys can have a stretch, um, do some squats, go outside, like just enjoy some, some break, okay? And then I'll come back at 10 past. Let's continue our break a little bit by um, watching a video um, so you guys can listen to someone else talk and not only just me. <laughs> um, so we're just going to see if you guys can hear the video. I don't know if I'm going to have to turn on some, uh, I don't know if there's a share computer sound. Okay. Just let me know if it's like too loud or anything. Can you guys hear? Hi everyone, my name is Claire. I'm Tyler. Today we're going to talk about advanced haptics API, including when to use, what to use, and how to use. So you want to add haptic effects for your app, 
and you found these two constants. Class, haptic feedback constants and vibration effect. But you may still have questions like, so what's the difference between these two, or what should I use for my app? We are here to answer your question. First, if you're working on very specific UI element with specific input event, such as keyboard for typing or button for clicking, then haptic feedback constants is a good place to start. Assuming that you're working on button, then it comes with a click event. Then just remember one thing. The reason that you want to have haptic feedback for click event is, in general, to simulate the behavior of the physical heart button which mostly come with a pairwise interaction model of pressing and releasing. Just remember the pairwise interaction of press and release and go find your haptic constants. For example, for keyboard, you can find keyboard press and keyboard release effect. For any other clickable element, you can also find another pair, such as virtual key and virtual key release. Then what about gesture? Haptic for gesture is usually happening like do while fashion. While I apply my gesture, I want to feel haptic. We call this types of effect as haptic texture. Haptic texture is recommended to be subtle yet crisp because it has to be repeated very quickly. So think about the clock app. Along the clock UI, you want to apply gesture to set time. And then you want to deliver haptic texture to represent the virtual tick mark under your finger. Similarly, when you drag the blue text handler and the text view left and right, when the selected area is changing by letter or word, you want to deliver haptic texture to represent the change. To support these types of interaction, we predefine constants called clock tick and text handle move. So now, assuming that you know which constants to use, in this case, virtual key and virtual key release, then the next step is to call those constants by perform haptic feedback and you're good to go. Uh, <clears throat> now there's another API, the uh, Vibration Effect API, and that's through the Vibrator service. Um, and this API you want to use when you care more about like the strength of the haptic happening um, rather than more the semantic meaning or like the gesture involved with it. Um, the other advantage to this API is you can use it without a view. So haptic feedback constants require a view um, but this you can call on a background service, um, you know, in case you're trying to notify the user without a UI. Um, so the basic um, starting haptic we have is effect click. This is kind of a medium strength haptic. It's very crisp, um, nice feeling on, on uh, modern devices. So um, we recommend you use that. If you want a lighter uh, haptic feel, you can use effect tick. Um, and for a stronger, uh, more intense haptic, you can use effect heavy click. Uh, there's also effect uh, double click, which is just two clicks for one after another. Um, and using this is pretty easy. You just call vibration effect dot create pre baked, and then you pass it the constant of the effect you want to use. Um, there's also a way that you can define your own custom waveform, um, and this is to if you want to create your own like custom haptic, which is pretty cool. Um, so f in this example, um, we have basically a waveform that looks you see this image down here. That's kind of what we're trying to make. Um, but basically, you pass uh, this function create waveform uh, an array of timings and array of amplitudes. Um, so we're going to start out with a full strength vibration, which is the uh, amplitude of 255, uh, for 100 milliseconds. And then we're going to pause for 200 milliseconds, that's the amplitude of zero. And then we're going to do a half strength vibration for 300 milliseconds. Uh, so you can see that in these arrays, uh, and you get what's down in the corner there. Uh, if you want to feel these for yourself on a new Pixel 4, come find us uh, upstairs in the afternoon. Uh, we have a demo app. You can try out all the constants and make your own waveforms. And if you have any questions or future requests for future haptics, please come talk to us as well. Yes, so a summary of that video is that you pretty much have these constants that you can use. And 
because haptics are uh, vibrations pretty much, you can use the vibrator API and everything to make your phone vibrate. And as they showed, you can create your own and do those waves where you can set how much you want it to rest for before it starts vibrating at like different levels. So there's a lot of like cool things that you can do there uh, to simulate some sort of feedback to the user that couldn't be conveyed the same way through sound or visuals. Uh, and as normal, going back to our good old friend, material design. They also have like these really cool guides for what you, what you should use. Um, so like, if you think back to when you're using your own phone, um, they typically provide on a tap and click. And also you can provide like some sort of feedback if you press a button for a longer time. Also really nice for when you want to grab the user's attention. So for alarms and reminders, notifications, incoming calls, and error and success dates. So generally, whenever you want to catch the attention, try to put in some vibration there. And then uh, you're gonna can make his app as you guys talk about in the chat. Seems like a nice app. Um, and then you can pair it with audio and video. And generally, just look at this. Um, this one is important. You don't want unpleasant ones because it's all about having the user experience good to be good and focus on um, yeah, the user's needs. Not as I talked about with the animations, you don't want to go crazy because if you annoy the user, they'll just delete your app and you don't want them to do that. Uh, oops, yeah. Uh, so on to the next one, which is gestures and the last topic I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so Android provides some special types of touchscreen events um, through gestures that are, uh, for example, double tap, scrolling, uh, long presses, uh, pinching, and all of these uh, go under the umbrella term like gestures. Uh, and you probably like used some of them before. For example, if you're on Google Maps and you need to zoom in, then you do this, like you use both your fingers to kind of zoom in and then you can zoom out as well or scrolling through things or yeah, you should be familiar with this. Uh, so as always, Android has a lot of uh, different APIs that you can use to create and detect gestures in your app. Um, however, your app should not depend solely on touch gestures for basic behaviors. And this is because um, some gestures may not be av available to all users and all contacts. And you may have people with some um, that cannot use it because maybe they have some physical impairs or something. Uh, but some touch-based interaction to your app can definitely increase the usefulness and overall just um, professionality. So uh, a touch gesture occurs when you, uh, when you are the user, I guess you're a user as well, place one or more fingers on the touch screen. And what happens is that your application interprets the pattern of touches as a particular um, gesture. Uh, and there are two um, phases in gesture detection, and it's gathering data about the touch event and also interpreting the data to see if it meets a sort of criteria for um, any of the gestures that your app support. So when your uh, application starts gathering data, uh, you're, so I'll imagine that you place one or more fingers on the screen. And when you touch the phone, this tr uh, triggers something called the untouch event on the view that you touch. And then for each sequence of, sequence of touch events, so maybe you put some extra pressure or you added another finger or you moved your finger around on the screen, uh, that will 
eventually be uh, identified as a gesture and the untouched event can be fired several times. Um, the gesture itself starts the moment the user first touches the screen and then the system will continuously track the position of the finger as it moves around the screen and the gesture ends when um, the finger is then released or leaving the screen pretty much. Uh, and throughout this whole interaction and just uh, placement of the fingers on the screen, something called a motion event is delivered to on touch event. And this motion event provides details about every interaction that goes on on the screen. And then your app can use the data provided by the motion event to determine what happened on the screen, what gesture happened, and then should it care or not pretty much. Uh, so here is some example code um, that we're going to actually do. Uh, what I realized, because this code is from the documentation, what I realized is that this is deprecated, um, but we'll do that, we'll deal with that in the, the example uh, in Android Studio. Um, what happens here is that we have pretty much a switch, which is called when, so a switch on the action, uh, and based on the action, you will log to the user what was happening. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend too much time looking at this code now because we'll do that a bit after, but I'll just go through the different constants that you can see. So uh, you pass in the event and then based on the event logs it. Uh, so you have action down, move up, cancel outside for this example. The most important ones for what I'm gonna show you are gonna be the first ones, but yes. Um, so as I said, the gesture starts when you press uh, the finger on the screen and that's called action down. So a press gesture has started and the motion contains the initial starting location. So when you start the gesture, it kind of notices where on the screen you touch and then calls the action down. And then as you move your finger across the screen or fingers, um, it will recognize that a change has happened during a press gesture. So as I said, it starts when you get action down and then it ends when you have action up. So move is in between. So, and then once you release the finger, it will call this action up and it will say that the gesture itself has finished. You also have the action cancel, which will uh, say that the gesture has been aborted and action outside, which will indicate that the movement happened outside of the UI element that you're listening to. So let's open up Android Studio here. Um, I don't know if you guys have been using logging. I know I helped some of you guys in the labs with logs. So I'll go through that today as well. Uh, give, okay, so someone asked, can you give an example of cancel? Uh, I guess if something happened with the system so that it does like interrupts the whole uh, event. When I've been testing this, I haven't managed to get it to cancel. So if Marius or Christopher have been uh, using the cancel one, you can <laughs> share the knowledge now. I haven't managed to get it to work. Oh yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, if you accidentally press something else, then uh, as you can said, maybe it happens. Uh, so we are going to first create the, we're gonna override the function called untouchen. And then we are going to create, create the action. So we're gonna get what action was going on. So that's the end. Um, we did not have, so in the slides, this part is deprecated. 
So instead, what we're going to use is that we're just going to get the event that is passed and then get the action from there. Okay. And we'll assert it. And then we're going to create the switch on the action. Import that and then action down. So testing that you guys paid attention to me. What does action down do? Please answer in the chat while I'm typing. <laughs> Charlie answered when you press the screen, that's correct. So we have something called log here. And you can put like log.e, dot e, dot d, and they stand for like, for example, log e is for errors, and then you can have for uh, assert, info, verbos, and stuff. So when you write log here, um, it, can, it comes up in your log cat at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, and then you can filter on the different types. So you can see all your errors and see all the info and stuff. And then you can also search based on a tag. Uh, so because we're doing this for debug, we're just going to write D for debug. And then you're going to have a tag. Uh, if you create, uh, so if, we, if you're going to reuse it, you should make your constant value. Uh, so debug. Um, do this. So we're just going to make the constant here and then in plus. So when this is fired, this is going to be, um, what is the company? What's wrong? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's going to be printing this out here. So it's really nice for when you're um, debugging, because then you can just use this. Don't use print line. I saw some people do that. Don't do that. Use this, and it's going to be more professional. Uh, and you can sort on it through here. So it's nice. Um, yes. So we have the action bound. And then we're going to do the motion event or action. Chat, you know what to do. What does action move do? <laughs> I'm gonna answer uh, when the user puts the finger on the screen and then it moves before being lifted. And Ardit wrote drag on screen, and that's. Correct. You guys have been paying attention today, which is good. Um, and then for some reason, it feels like you just make more typing errors when you're streaming or something. Um, and then you have to put the else here. That should work. So what we did was we created this uh, constant uh, that we're going to be using for uh, when we're doing the logs. So we can search on debug tag down here to find our um, log messages. And then we pretty much just um, told the app what to do or what to print based on what action we're doing. Uh, so I'm going to run the app. I have to find where, where did I put it? Oh, it's on the other screen. So here we can write debug tag, and that means it will filter on this one and only show the log messages. 
So you see, okay, I'm pressing now. I, I don't have that fancy indicate button thing. And it crashed. No, it's reinstalled. Oh, wait. Okay, now it's reinstalled. We have a lot of time. We're in the corona situation. I can sit here forever. Okay, there it is. Okay, so I'm pressing now, and you see here, and okay, I'm moving, and now I'm releasing up, okay? So I'm pressing again, down, moving, and then releasing up. Isn't that cool that you can just like do these things, and it will realize like, or it will notify you what you're doing. You can like imagine all the things that you could do, do with this, right? And, and then, um, and you could combine this with what you learned earlier in the lesson about animation. So when, imagine that you create your own gesture and then an animation will play based on that gesture you made. Uh, so these are just like the basic things, the basic foundation of like noticing the gestures. And like, this is really fun. And then if I delete this, wow, I get a lot of log messages. So this is pretty much like, um, everything that's going on. And I think it's really nice to be able to use this one. I hope a lot of you have been familiarized yourself with the log cat. Um, and yeah, you can also get it here and run. But for those of you who don't know about this yet, because I feel like some, some of you maybe don't know, but if your app crashes, you should look here in the run or in the log cat for uh, error messages and it's nice for just general debugging to use this log piece. Uh, yes. Any questions for this? Should be pretty straightforward. Thanks for stuff in the chat. I appreciate it. Yeah. So now that um, that's the move log position. I guess you could move that or log that as well. Is this the one? Um, I don't know if this is the one, that's probably not the one. Um, we have a lot of constants here that on the motion event page for things that you can get and log out. So I'm sure maybe you can get like query position and other properties apparently. So um, if there's anything that you want to specifically log or track, there's a lot of constants. So what you would do is for example, just replace the action with these ones. And you can get that wrote in the chat that uh, for logs uh, is that unit tests need an extra dependency not to crash. Yeah, so that's a really nice one as well. So remember that. It's back to here. So now that we've had a look at gestures in use and how you can actually use them in your app, uh, it might be nice to think about why do we really use gestures? Uh, and I think that gestures uh, highlights one of the one uh, of the amazing things about Android, and that is this whole opportunity for app developers and also people that or companies that work with Android. Uh, to try new and innovative approaches on their phone. Uh, and what's been going on is that for the four past years, there's been this rapid increase uh, in the number of different gesture patterns uh, that you can do on your handheld device. Uh, and Google uh, actually did some researching on this, uh, on how like gestures affected users and what did actually users get as a benefit from using gestures. And what they found is that gestures can actually be a faster and more natural and ergonomic 
way to navigate using your phone. And also, uh, they could be more intentional and easier to like understand than regular software buttons uh, that you accidentally might just trigger. Because you know, when you charge your phone, you can accidentally trigger a button and then you call your uh, grandma's best friend like you never talked to and how awkward isn't that but with gestures you actually have to intentionally do something and do a spe specific movement with one or several several fingers um, so it's the whole user experience is more intentional um, someone's asking is there really a knock gesture <laughs> is there yeah oh yeah knock apparently um, yeah so with gestures, you get to have this more immersive experience. Um, and, you know, we get more bigger screens. Now there's more space for us to do weird things on our phone. So yeah, that's good. But as usual, there are also some issues with things. So for gestures specifically, um, one cons could be that they don't really work for every user or that um, some users may not be able to use them. Uh, they're also harder to learn for beginners. Uh, think back to when you're trying to teach your grandma how to use your phone. What are smart smartphones? She doesn't want to use a smartphone, but you still have to make her do it. A button is easier for her to understand than gestures. Um, so that could take some adjustments. Uh, also, uh, gestures can interfere with an app's navigational pattern. Um, but based on Andre's experience is that the biggest issue is that uh, different phones, so you have like Samsung, Motorola, LG, OnePlus, all of them, they started having like their own gestures that were specific to a company, so like Samsung. But over the last one or two years, Android has actually been working with these companies and try to ensure a consistent user and developer experience by standardizing this whole gesture experience on Android. And also Google decided that because gestures don't really work for every user, and especially those with like limited dexterity and mobility, and the three button navigation that you see on the bottom of your phone, it's still gonna be there, so they're not gonna remove it just to keep that user experience flowing. Material design again. <laughs> so principles for gestures is, as I mentioned, they should be this alternative interaction. So in case your user can't really use gestures, it's just an alternative. Uh, but at the same time, they should be easy to use. You don't want everyone to do like uh, hand yoga every time they're going to use your app. Uh, and you should allow like di direct changes to UI elements. For example, zooming into a map on Google Maps or something. What I really like about this one for gestures is that it has like a do and don't section because it really will tell you don't do this. So let's look at the good one first. This is what you should do. You notice when you're dragging the item and sliding it, it flows, like it moves according to where you put your finger on the device. But then what you should not do is it feels like you drag and it doesn't move as you drag it. And what I did after I looked through all of these before is I actually went on my phone and I tried it out on my favorite apps where they have like these sort of animations. And I was like, hmm, they actually followed these uh, like principles and everything. I was like, good job, my favorite app people. Uh, good job. So you guys should try to go on your app, go on your favorite app, see do they follow this or not? And then if they don't, just send them this angry customer service email saying you had a bad user experience because they didn't follow like good principles. Just joking. Um, yeah, so same here. It's You should like get, remove it, flip it as you drag, but it shouldn't lag like this. This is just annoying if it lags like that. 
Yeah, so you can have some more look at this um, by yourself. Um, that was pretty much everything that I was going to talk to you guys about today. So I hope you have learned a lot of new cool things that you could poss possibly use in your assignment two or three. I uh, also guess now would be a good time for anyone who have assignment specific questions to ask them as we have uh, me, Marius, and Christopher here in the same room at the same time. So yeah, feel free to go wild in the chat and ask a lot of questions. And uh, also if anyone prefers to just talk uh, with their microphone and ask questions, you can do that as well. Well, to break the awkward silence here, uh, I think uh, it's sensible to, you know, uh, use that room since we have it. I think you really get, gave a brilliant overview and it was way more than uh, just focusing on animation and so on. It was basically really um, focused on the entire user experience, right? And the design, uh, sorry, device interaction, something that hasn't been covered uh, at that depth uh, before. So it's really, uh, really insightful. So really, really good talk, I must say. Yeah, thank you. It's like, there are so many things to take into consideration when you're making an app. It's not like only the functionality. There's a lot to think about because with apps, it's sort of different because people are always carrying their phones with them wherever they go. And they sort of rely on their apps to be like good so they can actually meet their needs. So that's why it's nice to think about these things. That's absolutely right, uh, but it's also a bit of a can of worms, right? So because uh, as as you know, with other features, there's always the demand to um, consider it um, early during the development, right? Without actually gaining um, immediately, at least, you know, substantive benefit, right? So so the content of the app, let's say recipe. Uh, management app is still slightly different. So people will really, by necessity, allocate the resources for developing this first and then think about the uh, animations. But it would be really good to know where the, uh, and I don't have the answer, it's more like a discussion point, uh, uh, where the sweet spot is between, uh, you know, considering it early and, and not overdoing it. You, you follow my thought? Uh, yeah. In terms of all the features that you present, because you have provided us with a, basically a library of all the aspects you could consider. Uh, and the challenge is then to, to choose and pick and see what's sensible and, uh, you know, what's what's uh, minimal uh, uh, or what, what should be minimally at least considered and what is really more uh, icing on the cake, right? So it's really hard to assess this because it really depends on the app you're, you're writing. So that will be um, interesting to see how people um, make their choices there. Yes, it's kind of interesting to see what sort of animations we'll find when we're reviewing people's submissions. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Yep, any questions about the assignments, the two and three? Let me quickly check if people are posting the projects already. Not really. Uh, some people are asking a question in the group chat. Okay, just uh, let me find myself where the window is. <laughs> Here it is. Okay, so networking. Um, so first question, is assignment to a pure a tech demo showcase with professionals? Yes, that's the whole point of assignment two. Uh, question two is, what is this about networking? Well, we basically would like you to fetch some data over the network. So the idea is that you use some sort of a web service or web API that allows you to fetch weather data or movie database data or something over the network. And then you sort of make use of it internally in your app. Um, so it can be anything. Uh, in the past, the, the, the smallest amount of work that the, uh, people did for this was downloading an image of a cat and print showcasing it as an icon on the app. Um, 
So if you can do that, that's the use of network already. So anything to do with network. Um, or cats, right? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so you should put your assignment to groups into the project groups. So the idea is that the project groups are for assignment to already in. Uh, you don't have to specify the theme of the app exactly uh, before you start working on assignment three because that only needs approval for assignment three. You don't need approval for doing assignment two. But we need groups because assignment two is group based and we need to group you uh, for marking purposes into groups. And to do that, we need a unique ID. Uh, and to do that, we need this wiki page. So we had this long discussion with Christopher how to do that. And after careful considerations, uh, the consensus was that unfortunately we don't have an ability to generate unique numerical IDs for groups ourselves yet. And that therefore we need your help to put that into the wiki page uh, at the moment. So all group, uh, all assignment to groups need to be registered as a group project, as a group, as a project group on the wiki, yeah. The, the only, the only uh, caveat is that you don't need to specify the idea fully yet uh, because you only need it for assignment three. For assignment two, because everybody's doing whatever they want, we don't care, it's a tech demo. Uh, and the tech is already specified and the way you use it, uh, the way you interpret it, it's up to you. Uh, this will become important for assignment three, but not for assignment two. I think this is a good opportunity for people to be creative and like try to think about an app you would use for yourself. Like think about like, what do I need? What do I want? Exactly. That's exactly the idea. Yeah. Good. Yeah. We're not pushing you guys to do a specific task, like more, except like you need to um, fill the check boxes, I guess, that are in the assignment description. But that's correct. There's so much you guys can do. And I think it will be more motivating to do it as well. If you can find some something that you want to make, something that is going to be like helpful for you in your own life, perhaps. That's, that's exactly the point. So you can explore, you can experiment, you can play with this and you can do things that don't necessarily make sense for the app itself. You can just play with the tech. Uh, and then for assignment three, you can throw out some of the things that you tried and you don't need or whatever. And then you just polish the actual features for the project itself. Um, yeah, anybody struggling with anything? So is there like a topic that would be really good for people to know more about? Are you fine with doing the, for example, the networking yourself? Or do you need a kind of help with this? Or do you need help with anything in particular? How to set up network? Um, yeah, we didn't have a specific lecture on that. I can um, I can talk a little bit about the networking. Yes. Yeah, I will check the schedule and see if we have anything planned. Otherwise, I just do something related to networking. Anything else apart from networking? So the the thing which will be tomorrow is about using the camera and kind of an introduction to augmented reality. So how to do kind of a see-through through the camera, how to use the um, OpenCV uh, library. Um, because the download is really big and because I didn't told every, uh, everybody to do that, I'm, I'm not sure if I will run a live session tomorrow or if I will do uh, a recording instead, because then you can download OpenCV and sort of follow the tutorial more um, asynchronously. Uh, the, those, the libraries I'm using, they turned out to be really big and like SourceForge downloads took like two hours for me actually. So um, yeah, I, I will decide tonight and let you know.
chances are it will be kind of recording and then you can use it uh, asynchronously to go with the examples and I will post the code into the repo of the of the course. So yeah, so camera and some uh, use of camera, some filters and some tracking that will be covered tomorrow. Um, what else would you need apart from the networking? Anything comes to mind for assignment two? Who is the stakeholder? So historically, when we had more of a personal contact with everybody, uh, the mobile projects were usually having someone who needs a mobile app and then groups were sort of fulfilling the, that need. So we had external people, external stakeholders who were interested in the development of uh, some sort of mobile app when and then um, the groups were kind of doing those apps for them and those those were the stakeholders we had uh, projects which were internally done by students who just wanted to do an app for themselves uh, we had apps which were done by game students it was like simple games uh, and we had some games done for like a nursing school for the computer vision lab for CSE shops, for CSE management. Uh, we had uh, stakeholders from uh, po police or military. Uh, so we had some external people interested in providing some project ideas and then students were kind of doing that. We had sometimes some small startups who wanted to experiment with some ideas and we had like, um, uh, a startup which was developing like a board which you can kick ball off and then they wanted an app to count how many times the the, the wall was kicked and and so on so we had some uh, some external people doing that so if you have someone like you know maybe your mom wants an app and you want to do this app for your mom uh, then your mom becomes a stakeholder right uh, so she kind of gives is a source of some of the ideas. If you have just internal stakeholders, just put yourself as a stakeholder saying, we're doing this up for us, we're gonna use it. Uh, but in general, stakeholder is someone who is this app for and who will use this app, who wants this app to be developed. Um, that's for assignment three. Yeah, that's right. So if you don't have any specific stakeholders and if it's only you and you're making a game or you're making some utility app for yourself, then that's fine. Then just say uh, it's for us and there is no email needed. Yeah. Uh, if you do have someone external, what we need those emails for is just we um, actually uh, it probably doesn't make much of a difference now. Uh, but we were notifying all those external stakeholders when the project were finished and when the presentations happen so they could attend the presentations uh, but given that uh, we don't we will not hold presentations you may just uh, you know skip the email and once you're done you just show those stakeholders yourself the the, the demo and the video um, so it, it, it can be managed by you not by us No, so that's the thing. The, uh, what, all we need is for you to register the, the group, but you don't have to register the members yet. For registering the members, we will have an additional uh, Google form where you will associate yourself with a particular ID uh, of a group. And that's where we will get the association between the members and the groups. So we don't need you to specify who is in the group, but we would like you to specify how many members the group will have. Uh, it's sort of like a double check that the system correctly has the sufficient, like, because if you say we should have four members and only three registered, then we will investigate why only three registered. Uh, otherwise we will not know that uh, one is missing. So in on the wiki page, tell us how many members the group should have. 
uh, but you don't need to specify who the members are. We will post a, a Google form for everybody to associate themselves with groups. In the future, we're hoping this will be automated and it will be done by the submission system. Right, Christopher? I lost him. You're highlighting event. Is that a conditional you're expressing? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm expressing hope. Hope is uh, the sensible, um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the script right. at this stage is right. All right. Um, yeah, sometime. Not for this one, unfortunately. So this this time we're doing the kind of uh, old fashioned way as we used to do it last year as well. Yeah, we kind of automating more and more things and making things a bit easier for everybody. But uh, yeah, that shouldn't be too much of a burden. You just need to yeah, specify the, the project group and then we will have the form to fill in. Um, and then the rest should be quite automated. Any other questions? Yeah, kind of a comment to, to Elizabeth because she was uh, telling me that she doesn't know how long uh, the lecture will be and so on. So I was planning to record this explanation about assignment two and I was so sure it's gonna be less than five minutes that um, I was really surprised that it took 18 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I have no idea why. Uh, to me today, I was like, uh, I think I only have enough material for like 40 minutes, but I managed to fill like one and a half hours. Yeah, exactly. And you were actually quite fast. You could have spoken a bit slower and you would easily fill in the whole two hours. Uh, so. Yeah, but yeah. it was the same for me. I was like totally surprised <laughs> that like like the five minutes of content I had took actually 18 minutes to explain. Um, there was a little bit of a uh, problem with Wiki initially, but that doesn't count <laughs> as for, for such an extension. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, it's, it's quite hard. Yeah, until you try it, it's quite hard to predict how long certain things or how long certain explanations will take. Yeah, and then you don't factor in like if people ask questions under like uh, during the lecture and like things didn't happen like as you said with the technology not working as it's supposed to. Or yeah, that's like right. That. That's right. Yeah, Zoom seems to be quite good. Um, you also have this option for people raising hand and then to pe pe you know attract your attention to the chat if they ask a question um, and you're presenting, so you can use that. Um, I was uh, last uh, last week on Friday. I went like Unity at the moment runs a big uh, class for uh, Unity Basics, and I just wanted to check how they run it, and they use it Zoom as well. Uh, but the thing is, they had to um, disallow this rising hand and all the other features because it was so disrupting for the presenters, and they had over 700 students in the class. Um, so the chat was also really hard to manage. Like I, I couldn't follow it. Like I was trying to follow the chat, but it was so quick that I just couldn't follow it. So they have like 10 moderators who read all the questions and try to answer them <laughs> because a presenter is unable to be presenting and following the chat as well. Um, but for smaller classes, yeah, it works quite well. Yeah, that sounds really tiring. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy that we have this comfortable size of people. I think we were around 20 today. Yeah. So I think that's nice. And I'm happy that some of you guys participated in the chat and shared your opinions and asked questions. And I think, I think it's important that we try to do these things now more that because or else this experience is just like me talking and no one's really responding. And like, so today was really nice. Yeah, I, I feel it that as well and it was really well done uh, class so thank you Elizabeth 
Thank Thanks you guys for being everybody here. for participating and I will announce tonight if we have live session tomorrow or I pre-record it um, before tomorrow class. So might see you tomorrow then. If you have okay. any questions in the meantime, uh, feel free to ask on the Discord, of course. So. Yeah, and I'm here as well. If you guys have any questions related to the things that I went through today or any uh, need any guidance or anything on assignment two and three, so just send a message. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.